Do you care about climate change? Do you wish that you could cure cancer? Or are you someone who just wants to unlock the unlimited potential of human ingenuity? Well, thorium is what you use, and the molten salt reactor is how you do it. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. And happy 4th of July, everybody. I am your host, Sean Kenny, and this is the first, very first episode of Rock Logic, a show that discusses natural resources, nuclear science, rare earths, and how they fit in today's discussion in regards to geopolitics. You know, right now, uh, I'm sitting in my apartment recording this episode. You're probably wondering, Sean, today is 4th of July. Why are you sitting in your house, you know, doing a podcast instead of going out and having a nice barbecue, enjoying the fireworks, all that stuff. Well, it's because unfortunately I'm a resident of the state of California. We've had a rise in coronavirus cases and uh, our fair governor and our, um, our wise mayor decided that it wasn't a good idea to celebrate 4th of July, that uh, we're going to just go ahead and cancel that and everyone stays at home. If you, if you don't live with that person, don't hang out with them. So that kind of screwed up my plan. So I just figured, you know what? Now is a good time any to record a podcast, especially one that discuss, uh, discusses politics. Um, my good friend and I have actually been talking about this for some time. Uh, this is something that I've had. It's a it's been a great passion of mine. Um, you know, just a little background on me. I've had a very uh, fruitful career in sales, marketing. I've worked for uh, I've worked in the renewable energy sector. Uh, I've worked for uh, medical trade associations. I, I've worked for uh, political consultancies. Um, about ten years ago, I got my first real job out of college, where I worked for the American Rock and Ray Society. And uh, what we mainly did is we covered um, nuclear science, radiology, and uh, specifically medical isotopes. Uh, it was around this time that I kind of got into the whole energy bug. I'm someone who's like a massive nerd, likes to know how things work, likes to understand how the economy works. And when you talk about economics, when you talk about the economy, it's really hard to not really talk about our industrial economy without talking about energy. Uh, it was around the same time I found out about thorium. And we'll get into that a little bit later, how that relates to medical isotopes and such. But uh, what was really fascinating to me is I just heard about this wonderful energy source I had never heard about before, never heard about it in school, never heard it in chemistry class, uh, which is weird because it's, you know, on the periodic table of elements, it's number 90. It's one of the most abundant sources, uh, materials in the earth's crust. And, um, I just kept reading on about it. And I figured, you know, at some point I'm going to find a problem with this. At some point, somebody's going to point out, well, thorium's stupid because you just, you can't do this or what I don't, I didn't know what the reason was going to be. I was going to find it, but it turns out in the 10 years that I've been wrapped up in this, I've actually found out every single day for the last 10 years that there is no problem with it. I mean, there are obviously any problems when you're talking about nuclear fission, but in terms of what it's capable of and its ability to unlock, uh, not just, nuclear fission as the the number one source of energy on our planet, but various other sectors, renewable energies, storage, fossil fuels. I mean, the, the, the list goes on in terms of the applications that you can implement in this. And we'll get into that. Um, this is going to be basically part one, where we're just going to talk about thorium, brief history of what it's all about. Uh, going into the future episodes, we're going to talk about uh, the ideal uh, application in terms of the reactors that we use uh, and how it's better than uh, what we're using today. And then part three, which is probably the one I'm looking forward to most, is just talking about the unlimited amount of applications that we could apply to this. Um, so with that said, let's uh, get started. So first of all, what the hell is thorium? I've, I've talked, I've said it probably like, like probably like 12 or 20 times in the, in the first two minutes of this podcast. What is it? Well, uh, it's, uh, it's element 90 on the periodic table of elements. It's one of the most abundant, uh, nuclear materials in the earth's crust next to uranium. Actually, it, there's more thorium than there is uranium, um, on this planet. I don't know if you knew that, but, um, it uh, has a 14 and a half billion year half life. It's about as old as the universe is. It's actually was started up in a supernova, which, I mean, 
probably one of the coolest origin stories you could think of. I mean, it, and uh, it, it was discovered in 1828 by an amateur, um, uh, an amateur mineralogist and one of the fathers of chemistry in Sweden. Uh, they named it after the North God Thor. Again, cool name, Thorium, awesome stuff. Uh, but it wasn't until the 20th century that we started to recognize what it was and what it could potentially do. Uh, back in World War II, uh, there was a scientist who worked on the Manhattan Project. His name was Glenn Seaborg. He worked out at Berkeley Labs. And uh, one day he got one of his grad students to take a, a bunch of different materials and hit it with a neutron bombardment system just to kind of test, hey, put this thing in this thing, see if it works, see if it fissions. If it fissions, great. If it doesn't, no big deal. Grad student comes back, says, uh, hey, uh, it fissioned and about two and a half neutrons came off of it. So I, I don't know what that means, but that's that's what it came off at. It's December 1942. Glenn Seaborg looks at his grad student and says to him, son, you just made a 50 quadrillion dollar discovery. Just to give you some context, this was back in 1942. OK, we hadn't even regulated atomic energy at this point. We hadn't even built the bomb. And we were already talking about making a 50 quadrillion dollar energy discovery. Obviously, the grad student didn't understand what the hell he was talking about. But Glenn Seaborg was one of the few people on this planet who understood that nuclear fission was the uh, was the future of energy in terms of unlocking human potential. And that thorium was so abundant that if you could just implement it in the, the right type of reactor, the right type of technology, that you could provide human beings with just unlimited energy. And when I say unlimited, I mean for thousands of years, we could live on this planet just running on thorium, no fail. I mean, it's it's the silver bullet. That's, that's, that's why it's the first episode, <laughs> the title of the first episode. It is literally the silver bullet for unlocking human energy potential. Now, um, obviously, uh, we went on with the Manhattan Project. We wanted to test it and see if it could work for bombs. Turns out, and I'll get into this, the minutia of it in later episodes, uh, but long story short, it's really not the best material to make bomb materials, which is probably why from a marketing perspective, it's such a great thing because unlike uranium, which of course we use to make bombs, we use to make a bunch of other stuff, thorium just cannot be related as, as that kind of an energy source. It, it cannot be related as an energy source that is associated with weapons, nuclear weapons or anything like that. So uh, another great thing to add into the, to the list of why thorium is such a great thing. Uh, over the 1950s, we started really getting into uh, nuclear power. Uh, we wanted to power submarines. We wanted to power this. The Army had a reactor program. The Navy had a reactor program. Sure enough, the Air Force decided they wanted a reactor program. They wanted a nuclear-powered bomber, uh, something that could fly over the Arctic Circle for weeks or months at a time without fail, so that if we ever went to war with the Soviets, uh, we could just drop the bomb on them and that would be it. Um, you know, a couple people looked at it, especially one guy. His name was Alvin Weinberg, who was the head of Oak Ridge National Labs at the time in Tennessee. He looked at it and he said to himself, hmm, nuclear-powered bombers... That is a really stupid idea, but you know what? The Air Force has a crap load of money, and I've been really thinking that uh, liquid fuel reactors is the way to go when it comes to fission, uh, at least for the civilian markets. So maybe I might be able to tap into some of that and use that. And he was absolutely right, because the fact of the matter is, is when it comes to operating really small, really efficient reactors, especially ones that could fit inside of an aircraft. Uh, you can't use solid fuels. You can't use what we use on submarines. You can't use what we're using today. You needed something just completely out of the box. And the molten salt reactor was uh, the thing that got us there. And we actually ran one from 1965 to 1969. Uh, this was a completely separate experiment, but uh, it ran for 22,000 hours. And it was a testament that we could run a reactor on thorium. We could re run a reactor on liquid fuels. Um, and because of its high temperature profile and a bunch of other features that I'll go into on part two, it just was like, it, it was just, it was just better than anything that we had ever come up with up to that point. And to, by today's standards, anything that we've come up from since then, I mean, it just, 
runs more efficiently, uh, runs cleaner. It produces a lot less weight. It actually does a lot. Even if you're not making breeder reactors, uh, if you're just talking about straight up burner reactors, it burns up 99% of the fuel in the reactor. Well, how does that relate into today's reactors? Well, a, a uranium light water reactor uses less than 1% and you throw the other 99% away. It's extremely inefficient. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot to be said about this as an energy source, but Again, uh, we'll talk about that on part two. Part one, I really just kind of want to focus on uh, thorium as a material resource. Um, you know, a, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, uh, thorium is one of the main reasons why we live on this beautiful green planet. Uh, it's the reason why we have a, a spinning molten core that, you know, produces an electromagnetic shield, protects us from solar radiation, pr protects us from cosmic rays. And, uh, you know, uh, some people back in the 19... Uh, 40s and 50s and 60s, they think, hey, it's done all this great stuff for us so far. Can we can we take a little bit of it and can we put it into some, you know, practical industrial use? And they said yes. But unfortunately, you know, it was a different time. We had different wants. We had different administrations that just didn't really have the foresight uh, in terms of uh, what America really needed to be in the 21st century. And uh you know, I, I think we made a lot of poor, short-sighted decisions, and uh, that's kind of what led us to today. And uh, it really kind of brings us now into 2020. You know, uh, I, I talked about earlier, you know, we're uh, we're doing nothing but talking about COVID-19. We're talking about China. And probably one of the main reasons why I wanted to start this podcast in the first place was because there's just so much that we don't talk about. Uh, in mainstream news, we don't talk about it on Fox. We don't talk about it on uh, CNN. We don't talk about it on Vice or anything else. But uh, people just don't realize how incredibly dependent we are on China to run our economy. You know, one thing I will say that is positive and just put it into context, COVID-19 is a horrible disease. Hundreds of thousands of people have died across the world. But, you know, for Americans, we've we've come to realize that there are some serious vulnerabilities Um in the way that we run our economy. Like the one thing we are talking about is, Hey, you know, we're not making our own antibiotics. It's crazy. I was listening to a podcast with Charlie Kirk the other day where he was talking about, you know, they, we, they make all our antibiotics. They make our drugs. It's a good thing. They don't make our Patriot missile systems. The sad thing is, is I just went crazy for 15 minutes because he just didn't know the guy who was running the podcast didn't know. They are making our Patriot missile systems, or at least the critical components that are needed to make it work, the gyroscopes and the rare earth materials. The fact is, China has a sovereign monopoly in regards to rare earths. And when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, mining it, refining it, processing it, we do a little bit of mining here in California, but unfortunately, we don't have any refining capability whatsoever. We don't have a industrial supply chain. So anytime we mine any of it, it literally gets shipped to China where they turn it into stuff and then they sell it back to us as a finished good. And uh, really, I just don't think that that's the way we should be running our economy. Uh, I would like to see a, a major transition in the next five to 10 years uh, away from Chinese manufactured into the United States. Can that be done? Absolutely. Are, is that something we're going to talk about on the show? 100%. Why are we talking about thorium on uh, podcast number one? Because the really critical stuff, uh, the really hardcore value chain rare earths are found or, or in like 99% of most cases are found with thorium. You know, you mine rare earths, you're going to have thorium as a waste pipe product. Uh, you want to mine for thorium, you're going to have rare earths in there. Uh, there's just no way that you can separate one from the other. And it's also one of the reasons why we don't do a lot of our own rare earth mining. And as a matter of fact, we were doing rare earth mining up until the mid, uh, mid 80s, but we leaked some thorium into a tailings lake in uh, California. Um Another great thing about thorium is, though it is a source of radioactivity, the radioactive half-life is not significant enough to cause any serious bodily harm. As a matter of fact, you can have about a thousand pounds of this stuff in your basement. Uh, you could probably eat the stuff. Wouldn't kill you. Um, I wouldn't recommend that you eat thorium in the same way that I wouldn't recommend anyone drink a gallon of gasoline or three gallons of milk. It's not good for you, but it won't kill you. At least not right away. <laughs> but my point is, uh, there's a lot of really, uh, there's a lot of preconceived notions about 
sources of nuclear radioactivity. Thorium, unfortunately, it was experimented on back in the 1960s because we saw it as a potentially revolutionary nuclear fuel. And unfortunately, you know, because of that, uh, when mining companies find thorium, they have to treat it as such. They have to treat it like it's weapons grade plutonium or enriched uranium when it isn't. It's it's just there. It's it's literally as common as dirt. I used to live in Florida. Uh, you can find uh, thorium in the East Coast beach sands. It's it's found in phosphate deposits. It's find it's found in uh, monazite sands. It's it's extremely common. This material. As a matter of fact, one of my friends, uh, you know, was coming from Texas. She brought a bunch of rocks uh, from her. I guarantee you, there's probably some monazite in there with some thorium content. You know, I, I would be very surprised if it didn't. You just need a Geiger counter to ver uh, verify that. But the thing is, uh, I, I'm really passionate about this stuff because I don't think there's really anything out there that can unlock this potential. And when it comes to rare earths, and we'll discuss that in uh, future episodes, um, the, the problem is mainly regulatory. We haven't had an administration that really has had a grasp or understood um what we need to do in terms of solving this crisis. Uh, however, there have been some significant changes in the last several years under the Trump administ administration, primarily, where we've seen some positive shifts in this. And obviously, with COVID-19 being the main talking point in uh, today's political discourse, um, it's probably going to be something that is going to talk uh, be talked about a lot more. Because uh, as China becomes more and more aggressive on the world stage, we're probably going to be talking about moving jobs back here or at the very least uh, moving supply chains back here so that we can start manufacturing our own products. But the key to solving that problem uh, pertains in thorium. And if we're going to do that, we're going to need to figure out a way to make uh, some functional economic use out of it. The good news is it's extremely abundant and it's the most valuable resources on this planet with almost no value because you can only use it in a, sp a specific type of reactor and we're just not building them right now. So right now you can just buy the stuff on the cheap. Nobody cares. Um, and because of how abundant it is, literally we can run for the next millennia on this stuff um, with just maybe about six or 7,000 tons. Um, and you can run the entire global economy on it. Uh, we'll talk about that on the next podcast uh, for right now. I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, part two, we're going to be discussing the molten salt reactor and the lifter. Uh, one of my favorite talking points about that is uh, it has the potential to cure cancer. And if you want to, if you want to sign up, uh, if you want to hear about that, uh, tune in on the next episode. Uh, again, this is Sean Kenny, and this was the Rock Logic Podcast.